Hello, welcome to the show. Today we have on a special guest. His name is Alex Pritchard. You might have heard of him. Uh, He is a senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Exeter. His current research aims to develop a radical new understanding of the concept of anarchy. In 2005, Dr. Pritchard co-founded the PSA Anarchist Studies Network and in 2012 co-founded and now co-edits the monograph series Contemporary Anarchist Studies. Welcome to the show, Alex. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So you have a few books that I'm really excited about um, that came out recently. If you want to go ahead and get started talking about those, we could jump right in. Sure thing. Thanks. So um, I want to talk about Proudhon's War and Peace, but let me say a few words just to sort of contextualize where this new translation came from, um, because I think that will help sort of tell you a little bit more about the other books that I've written too. So um, I've got three three books came out over the summer, uh, two short ones and, a, and this substantial thing by Proudhon. So this is War and Peace. And then the other two are A Very Short Introduction to Anarchism, published by Oxford University Press, and Anarchic Agreements, A Field Guide to Collective Organising. I'm really proud of, of all three books, obviously, but they're all sort of linked in a in a fairly coherent way, I think. So when I was trying to make sense of Proudhon's War and Peace, I was really struggling because the way in which we understand anarchism didn't really leave much room for thinking about international relations. And so a lot of what we, not just myself, but the Anarchist Studies Network and a whole bunch of colleagues and friends over the last 15 years have been trying to sort of retell the story of where anarchism came from. And so I think that this very short introduction is sort of a reintroduction to, to anarchism born of that debate and discussion that we've been having as a as a network over the last 15 years. And then Anarchic Agreements is is essentially a a book about how anarchists organize. And what we argue is that anarchists essentially constitutionalize and they do it routinely. So constitutionalizing is much more than just, uh, you know, writing rules and declarations and so on, but those are two very important parts of it. Actually, it involves building institutions and writing declarations. And one of the things that we've noticed about anarchist groups is that they do this all the time. Anarchists tend to talk about, you know, we have these debates about whether democracy is the right thing for anarchists to be plugging, whether this is the, you know, the key concept that sort of brings a bit of credibility to anarchists. We say, actually, that's selling anarchism short. Anarchism is, you know, it's full of really important ideas about how to organize without the state and private property. And then, uh, you know, Anarchic Agreements kind of sets that out. We built, we wrote this book with Seeds for Change uh, and alongside and with a whole bunch of different organisations, uh, grassroots organisations, anarchist organisations. And the aim was to sort of give that back and show people how uh, we have interpreted how this is, do- how anarchists organise. And, you know, there's some worksheets at the back and so on. But anyway, let me just say one more thing and then we can get on to War and Peace. So Anarchic Agreements is... Essentially, the latest, so War and Peace is, uh, the subtitle of War and Peace is on the principle and the constitution of the rights of peoples. And the rights of peoples is an English translation of the Latin term just gentium. Just gentium is a a really long tradition of thinking about the rights of peoples. And so where do communities come from? Where Where do the principles of political community come from? On what do they rest? And so on, which is, you know, a classic Republican uh, constitutional set of arguments and so really anarchic agreements is just a a continuation you know 150 years in between the two books of course but you know it's a continuation of that of that discussion and that debate about where and how anarchists constitutionalize Uh, i think that's really interesting i don't want to get too caught up here but i uh when you think about this in relation to like national nationalism studies or something like that Mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of uh relevance in Proudhon's work, especially War and Peace. Mm. And um, maybe we'll get to talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. But um, just in my reviewing of uh, some of Proudhon's work before talking to you, you know, I was reading What is Property? Mm-hmm. And one of the first things, you know, that anyone who actually bothers to read it will notice is that uh, a lot of it is framed in a theory of justice. Mm-hmm. And 
if you could explain what justice is for Proudhon and why that's where he begins, uh, that'd be awesome. Okay. So, yeah, you're right. So, the, I mean, this is, again, it's the classical Republican way of telling stories about politics, particularly, you know, all the way through the early modern, modern period. The, the aim is to think about principles of right and justice, right? And so, classically, there are sort of three main ways that you can do this. One is deontology, comes from Kant. That's the argument that essentially moral uh, moral principles can be deduced rationally, and that if we find the right moral principles, then we can organise society in coherent ways around them. So the categorical imperative you know, has to be universalised, and if you can find those principles that can be universalised, if you find enough of them, then society can be run in a rational way. And the other way of thinking about it is in terms of consequences or utilitarianism, that is like trying to seek out the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And that essentially you judge all actions, not in terms of what you're doing, but in terms of their outcomes. So if, you know, they lead to virtuous or moral behavior, uh, outcomes, then they're good. And then the third way of thinking about it is in terms of virtues. And I think this is where Proudhon comes from. So rather than seeing principles as the guiding guiding force of morality and seeing those as rational and rather than seeing the, the outcome or the end point, is, is to think about uh Morality is emerging in society. It's not quite how the classic tradition pitched it. So back in the olden days, uh, virtues were character traits, and those character traits were fixed usually by biology, but certainly by night by nature, right? So women and slaves couldn't be virtuous by virtue of that. But as that tradition unfurled and as it developed through the 19th century, it became much more apparent to people that your characteristics are socially derived, right? They're, they're forged in society. And so when Proudhon's talking about things like ethics and justice, he's trying to get us to think about the ways in which justice emerges from a confluence of our sort of instinctual vitalist bodies, if you like, and the ways in which we build society. So Proudhon thinks essentially that justice is, is both a consequence and a cause of society. So justice, to put this in another way, justice is the outcome of social conflict. So what is right and what is good is the ways in which we have together decided that we're willing to coexist. And the source of that is both our conscience, so the thing that drives us, so natural impulses, things that we don't really, un well, he certainly didn't understand, because he was a raging sexist as well. So, you know, but the, you know, there was a, he he believed, and I think quite rightly in many respects, that humans have an innate sense of justice and right. And that is why you see societies are more or less the same throughout history and different, uh, and across geography. So the societies are structured around some basic principles, and his aim was to try and find those. And those principles were born of our bodies. But then justice emerges as a social phenomenon through that social conflict, through, through the articulation of those principles. And, you know, so societies change and evolve, you know, um, technology develops and so on. So the, the basic principles that we have always articulated in different contexts. So he's rather than rather than abandon morality, which is what the positivists were doing at that time, he tried to reclaim it and say, actually, morality is a really important tool for not only understanding the dignity of the individual, but also for understanding how society works. And he did that through, uh, you know, De La Justice, which is the book he publishes before War and Peace. De La Justice on Justice is, it has 12 studies, and it's about um, two and a half thousand pages long. So it's about 200, and I can't tell you how many hundreds of thousands of words it is, I forget now, but it's huge. And so War and Peace essentially is a case study for this, this claim about justice. So and I, I set this out in the introduction to the book, but essentially one of the books is called um, Progress. And he, in this book on progress, which is part of De La Justice, he's trying to understand how morality can be progressive Right, because typically we say, well, you know, let's say the, in the virtues tradition, character traits are fixed. And what he's trying to say is, well, they can't be fixed, but they must be fixed in some way because otherwise we couldn't, there wouldn't be any continuity in human character over time, right? So how then do we get a sense of how principles, social principles of justice change, in spite of the fact that humans haven't changed that much? And so, what are the drivers of that process? And then War and Peace becomes this, you know, 200,000 word case study for that question, essentially. Um, one thing in your introductions, and I think also in 
a book you didn't mention, which is uh, Anarchy, Justice, and Order. Or what is the main one you did on international relations? Yeah, that's the one, Justice, Order, and Anarchy, yeah. Yeah. Um, you talk about how much Prudhomme wrote, and mm. that is not translated to English. And yeah. um, uh, I think it's important just to give people a real sense of that, because I it blew my mind. He's treated as such like a, a preamble to proper anarchist theory by a lot of other anarchists and... That's right, uh, yeah. I think that helps kind of pop that idea. So, I mean, he's, his, his published writings go into 50 volumes or thereabouts. I think the, the, the collected works is about 50 volumes of, sorry, no, let me rephrase that. Sorry. 50 volumes includes his notebooks and letters. Okay. And then the complete works, but his published books, I think there's about 30 published books over a period of about 25 years. So bear in mind, I think this is, and this is really important. Proudhon managed to sustain himself and his family simply on the proceeds of his publishing. Right, so he, he was a he was a writer, but I mean, bear in mind what he's writing here. He, like I said, he's writing in the tradition, classic traditions of political philosophy. He's self-taught, but he's able to sell a, the, a quantity of literature that enables him to sustain his family. I mean, that's quite incredible, really. I mean, that's not to say he didn't take loans, which he did, and he often struggled to pay them back, and he tried to set up a bank in the 18, in 1848-49. He tried to do all sorts of weird and wonderful things, but the basic fact of the matter is that he survived on the proceeds of his publishing, which is quite astounding when you think about it, um, given that he came from nothing and had nothing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so... Just uh, just wanted to get that out there. Um, yeah. Back to his notion of justice. I know one of the things he focuses on a lot is the idea of equality. And mm -hmm. um, I know that's definitely in his earlier work. Does that carry through into this later work with uh, war? Yeah, not, not really, I don't think. No, I think... So Proudhon's... Proudhon's concern with equality is really a sort of an ontological claim about how we're all basically the same. It's not, it's not a political claim about what we should be achieving. So he's not an egalitarian in that sense, though. He's more an equalitarian. He's more into, um, into equity rather than equality. So when, we, when you trace it through into war and peace, and I think we're going to come to this later about what causes, causes war, inequality causes war. But the solution to that is not more equality necessarily, but a transformation, complete transformation in the what we now call the mode of production. Of course, he was talking then about um, uh, French society, European politics, the emergence of capitalism, and so on. It's not the it's not the inequality of that that's particularly pernicious, but the structure which enables it. So all societies are unequal. So for Proudhon, inequality is what makes society necessary. Okay, so he takes this from people like Adam Smith and August Kant and others. You know, inequality is something we have to live with, but that doesn't mean that we have to accept it. So the whole point of society, the whole point of constitutions is to equalize unequal relationships, at least in principle. So all constitutions balance power. So if you don't have an imbalance of power, there's no need for constitutions. Of course, that's exactly what Marx argued after Proudhon, is that, you know, well, in the perfect communist utopia, we don't need constitutions anyway. So why are we even bothering with all of this? Proudhon never thought we'd get there. And he said that the whole point is to find that constitution that best balances those unequal relations. So equalizing people in society who are fundamentally unequal. And the whole point of the constitution then is to try and find that egalitarian, quote unquote, balance. Um, and I can talk more about that maybe a bit later. But it, it's, yeah, it's... It, yeah, I think that, that that's that's pretty much how I'd explain it. All right. So a lot of people will uh, think about the classic anarchists as adopting this naive position of mm -hmm. everybody being good and equal and uh, this sort of idea about human nature that I guess comes from Rousseau. Mm -hmm. And they'll attribute that to the classic anarchists. But what you're saying is that Crudhone's theory really comes more from a idea of conflict uh, and inequality mm -hmm. and um, that this gives right. It's like the necessary condition for uh, a constitutional um, framework mm. for conducting human affairs with the goal being to equalize. Mm. So 
how does so how does inequality lead to war and how does uh how does that get um mediated through nation states mm. and and so on and so forth yeah good questions right so let me just let me just make one point about Rousseau first so um Proudhon and Rousseau are really close together okay but I think we might just need to change how we think about Rousseau just a little bit so Rousseau has this fake anthropology right where he says that in the pre-social environment all humans are equal you know these noble savages and so on that's total nonsense, okay? And, and I think he probably knew that at the time. But the, it's, a, it's a thought experiment that helped him explain, you know, the sort of state of nature and then this fall from grace. And modern civil society is is this terrible place that is fundamentally unequal and money is terrible. I mean, Proudhon and Rousseau are really close on that, okay, except for the fake anthropology. So Proudhon is much more historical. So he he's not of the view that there is some sort of pristine past. Actually, the whole point of War and Peace is to show actually how um, the past is pretty horrific and things might be getting better, but we need to have a really careful look at how that evidence unfurls. But if Proudhon and Rousseau are starting in the same place, they're starting in the same place because they think inequality is a key driver of conflict. And like Rousseau, Proudhon thinks that money and modern society is one of the key corrupting influences on people. The difference, however, is where they think justice and the state and you know the you know the ideal polity will come from. So for Proudhon. The state can never be founded on justice. It's founded on claims to justice, but a state can never be the the expression of justice, particularly in the Rousseauian vein, because for Rousseau, the, the force of the state has to force people to be free, in the classic phrase that Rousseau uses, okay? Because the state must make everyone equal in principle, and it has to enforce the civil religion and so on, so that people are are created essentially okay and that this is what gives the political community legitimacy now for Proudhon of course if it takes violence to make a political community there's not very much about that political community that can really be said to be just it has to be based on principles freedom justice and so on but how does inequality lead us to that point so Proudhon I would say makes there's a classic argument by a guy called Charles Tilly he says that wars make war states make war and wars make states. Proudhon makes pretty much exactly the same argument, of course, 100 years, 150 years prior. So for Proudhon, then, inequality emerges from the centralization of power, the deployment of military means to sustain that military power, and then the imbalance in the economy that's caused by having to tax populations to sustain both the military and the state and the luxuries that the elites enjoy. And so by taking from society and essentially demanding that society subsists on less than the full product of its own labor, you're essentially producing social conflict. So for Proudhon then you don't see a distinction between the domestic and the international. What we're seeing is conflict that is universalized, increasingly universalized, and caused by this attempt to address the the contradictions that emerge from perpetuating inequality within societies by elites. Proudhon also says, excuse me, lots of things about the ways in which people, uh, he, he, the, the back end of War and Peace, one of both those books really are are diatribes against gluttons, against the Epicureans, against this sort of this desire for material wealth. And, you know, he says that this this sort of acquisitiveness, which is, you know, it's something that Rousseau was also really vehemently against too, it might be said, you know, that it's that drive for luxury which is destroying society. And he argues that human societies, modern societies, ought to try and recover a sort of an ascetic um ethos right and so there are a couple of people that really ran with that argument one was Tolstoy and of course after Tolstoy Gandhi right and so you can trace Proudhon's arguments through those two and into the civil rights movement in the 19 well, from the 1930s all the way through to the 70s so how do you think that holds up today with current uh international relations research and state theories uh and things like that Mm, yeah well how does it hold yeah 
So I've really struggled to make sense of it in terms of contemporary theories because we don't tend to look at it in that way anymore. But recently I've come across the degrowth literature that's really helped me understand what Proudhon was trying to do. So typically bear in mind that, you know, most left of center theories about the causes of war sound very similar to what Proudhon's arguing. But the argument that Proudhon makes about how to address the causes of war run against the standard left-wing progressivist, fully automated luxury communism, you know, progress, industry, and so on. All of those things are not necessarily bad, but for Proudhon, the ways in which they're articulated means that they are perpetuating forms of inequality rather than addressing them. So when you look at the, compare Proudhon's sort of left-wing view of international relations to more standard accounts today, Proudhon is different in two ways. One, he, he as I said, he's, he's running against the, running a great, uh, trying to swim against the tide when it comes to theories about modernity, development, the role of the state in, you know, and then, the, in, but secondly, you will not find a left-wing approach to international relations that's more or even comparably focused on justice. I mean, the way in which Proudhon approaches international relations from that perspective of just gentium is unique, I think, in the contemporary literature, in the literature for the last 150 years, particularly from the left. The idea that somehow justice can be understood historically and sociologically is pretty radical today. You know, and it was <laughs> fairly common back then, but that's the that it's it's un, it's not common to find people talking about justice in the same breath as they talk about inequalities, about the state, um, you know, anti-statism and so on. Uh, that, that's pretty rare. You know, so it, does, it, it doesn't, doesn't sound very typical. Yeah, especially uh, in anarchist conversation. I mean, a lot of the trends of the past 20 years have been to move away from any kind of moralistic sounding mm. language or uh, post-anarchism and mm. things like that. Um. Well, so while we uh, while we're talking about Prude Hone, and before we move on to the next question, uh, you did mention his sexism. There's also his, his uh, anti-Semitism. I recall that the way you addressed his sexism was actually fairly interesting. Um, I think it was in the Justice Order and Anarchy book, but he has some like really um elaborate views on marriage or something and would you can you talk a little bit about that and maybe like contextualize what exactly his issue was with uh gender and things like that sure okay so um there are three things okay so there's the the sexism the racism and the anti-semitism the other two are connected obviously but i'm going to keep them separate just to make sense of them so the sexism so the racism and the anti-semitism are not as significant as his sexism, okay? I hesitate to call him a misogynist, but it's bloody close. I mean, essentially, so in the 19th century, Proudhon, Proudhon comes from a peasant family, okay? And I don't know, uh, I mean, working class families have very unique structures, often considered really patriarchal. Proudhon's family is slightly different. And I think in many respects, more typical, perhaps, of a standard peasant working class family. Proudhon's family, very strong matriarch. The mother was the real leader in the family. The father was a bit of a, a bit of a, a chancer, I suppose, but, but certainly a failure in his business exploits and really struggled to sustain the family. But Proudhon's mother was the backbone of that family. And in many respects, Proudhon has this sort of my mm, puritanism is not the right word, but I suppose it's the one that resonates most. You know, he has this very strong notion of, you know, this uh, sort of a, a, a almost Protestant idea of how families ought to be run. Uh, and this is, it, it, it becomes a central focus for him as he goes through. So Proudhon then, of course, as he gets older and starts thinking about these things, starts reading books by August Comte and others and other people who start talking about psychology. And then there's this new science of phrenology, which is the shape of the head and the size of the cranial capacity and all these sorts of arguments. And then, you know, people start, biology becomes a real subject. And suddenly people start saying, well, you know, men have different shaped bodies to women and so on. And in the 19th century, Proudhon gets caught up in all of this. And then by the time he gets to around about, of the 1850s 
he starts making these really bold claims about the categorical distinctions between men and women and becomes a real biological determinist when it comes to the differences between men and women and says that women are fundamentally less capable than men cranially, uh, intellectually, uh, but also physically, and that men are, you know, at the top of the social pyramid. But he says that, like I said earlier about the inequality, don't forget, right? He says that the whole point, that inequality does not doom women to servitude. What What's needed, he argues, is a constitutional framework that equalizes that relationship while re- recognizing the inequalities and the differences. Now, he might have been completely wrong about the way in which men and women are different or whatnot, but it's interesting what he does next. So he then says, what we need is the nuclear family in which men and women are what he calls an androgynous couple. Okay, so they sit side by side within the family, the nuclear family, which is essentially the microcosm of all society. The patriarch sits here, the matriarch sits here, and together they they have their zones of influence within the family. And it's really, you know, and it quickly becomes obviously hugely, um, you know, conventional for that time. It's not particularly scientific. I mean, as Jenny de Hericourt says, you're mistaking uh, this, your, your imagination for the scalpel of science, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, and so he gets absolutely hammered for this by feminists at the time, right? So, you know, everyone said this is complete garbage, but every time he 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 gets attacked, he doubles down. So his sexism becomes worse and worse and worse as it goes along. Now his, so, I mean, you can read about that elsewhere. I mean, it is pretty vile and it gets really bad later on because he's, you know, he's taken to the cleaners by the feminists who are, who are writing against him and rightly so, right? Well, yeah. And it's one of the main reasons I think a lot of anarchists today won't read him. Yeah, well, that's right. I know. And I think that, but I mean, it gets worse. So, I mean, the thing is, you, you then add that to the racism and the anti-Semitism. You know, most people just switch off completely. So Proudhon then believes that, you know, Proudhon's a racist, okay, and in, 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 in a specific sense of that term. He believes that races, races exist, okay? And at the time, of course, that was fairly standard. And I don't know, people still think that today, of course. I mean, but he says that, you know, there's nothing fundamentally different about humans. Humans are the same. The differences are social positions. So it's not because people have different colored skin that they sit in a different position in the social hierarchy. It's because of the way in which society is developed. And so the point of an anarchist society is to try and equalize those relationships. And then, of course, there's passages in this book and others where he says, talks about, you know, essentially what we call the white man's burden to try and, you know, raise the social standing of of, of slaves at the time. Um but it's not on the basis of the incapacity necessarily, but in the social incapacity. So he, while he thinks women cannot be the same as men and are naturally inferior, he doesn't think that races are in, are inferior relative to one another, which is interesting. Now the anti-Semitic, so that is pretty clear in the writing, by the way, and it's it, it's it it's I mean it, there are places where it's disgusting, and there's you know. I mean, at the time, right. I'm sure people will have recoiled, but you certainly will if you read it today. But it's still all in there. The anti-Semitism is 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 more complicated and less obvious, and it's slightly contentious to talk about it too. I mean, there's no question that he's in some of his notebooks and passages. He does uh, make really outrageous claims about um, about Jews and about where he thinks Jews should live and so on and so forth. Um, and it gets worse, obviously, and I'm glossing, but I, I do apologise. But I mean, but, and I don't, uh, so the, the claims he makes are more subtle than he makes about race or about women. And I think it's tied up in his critique of the Sansimonians, the utopian socialists. So the utopian okay. socialists were this really progressive movement in sort of um, uh, restoration French politics, often... Um, led by women like Jenny de Hericourt, who was also a Sansimonian, who takes Proudhon to the cleaners later for his sexism, but um, also people like, um, oh, there's a whole, I'm losing names now, but the Sansimonian movement had a number of really prominent Jewish um, people within that movement, who later became uh, really prominent people in French politics. And Proudhon was obviously in battle with these men uh, throughout his intellectual career. And a lot of then his, a lot of what you can read as his critique of the Sansimonians, who he called sort of dally, you know, these sort of, I mean, the problem with French society at the time, he, he it was 
concubines, prostitution was rife. He associated all of this with with you know the dalliance of of, uh, of 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 romantic men in the nineteenth century. He thought this was a symbol of the decline of France and so on and so forth. And and you know, I mean, it goes on and on. And you can hear these echoes. And I've I've read pieces where you know you can see this association, this anti-feminism links to anti-Semitism, and you know the, the stuff that he writes in about war. And you think, oh, you know. That's a little bit close to fascism. And you can see that then. So people like Shapiro and others have claimed that Proudhon was a, a proto-fascist, which is nonsensical. I mean, it just it, that doesn't make sense on any level, except for the fact that he was an anti-Semite uh, and, uh, an anti, and an anti-feminist. But I mean, I, there are a whole bunch of people who think those things, but they're not fascists, right? And also it's anachronistic mm-hmm. to make those claims too. And I mean, I suppose the the key problem with this argument, of course, is that Proudhon thinks that the state and private property should be abolished, which is hardly a fascist position. So, I mean, there are there are issues there, but you can see how that argument unfurls in the in the literature. So, I mean, the question I have, you know, knowing all that is, and since we are talking about war and peace, is how does he relate this to, you know, what the biggest one of the biggest questions at the time was the national question, mm. uh, the what is a nationality? Should it be the foundation for statehood and things like that? Yeah. So Proudhon thinks that Proudhon thinks that the um, the discourse about nationality is fundamentally dangerous, and he thinks that it is a really bad idea. So he doesn't think there's anything intrinsic about people at all ever. Okay. No, there's nothing about people that distinguish us as groups or as individuals. We're all more or less the same, as far as he's concerned. That said, when people come together, we create communities, and those have intrinsic value because they're what make it possible for us to be individuals. But that doesn't mean that there's anything necessary. You know, we're not we're not fundamentally tied to the land. We don't. We're not Volk. We're not of the land in the sort of the German tradition. And contrary to the French tradition, peoples a peoples is not made by the constitution. Peoples are made mm. by the ways in which they agree with one another, how they want to be. Uh, how they want to lead their lives. So nationalities then are a real problem for him. And he says, the, you know, after War and Peace, he goes on to write three or four books on, on the unification of Italy. He writes uh, uh, an unpublished manuscript on the unification of Poland. And he says that those those attempts to unify those countries are fundamentally misguided because Italy is made up of hundreds of nationalities, quote unquote, or what he calls peoples. Likewise, Poland... And he says that you know these, this is a this is this is antithetical to freedom. It's the opposite of freedom. Nationalism is the opposite of freedom. And that argument then is taken up by people like Rudolf Rocker and others later. Um, but it's really important that we make that distinction because you know all of these the sort of the anti-Semitism, the racism, and so on. Those were they were self-evidently strong currents in nineteenth-century thought. But the right. ways yeah. in which different theorists then transformed that thinking into something which they hoped would be egalitarian or free, uh, you know, pro-freedom um, is really important to, to retain, I think, because those are the key claims that we want to use today. Yeah. Uh, so um, one, uh, the more you talk about, you know, the way that he basically sees human beings and the way that their uh, relationships with each other constitute different sorts of groups and it really reminds me a lot of what I read in Sartre and mm-hmm. other existentialist thinkers. And which brings me to this whole, whole question about Proudhon's work being works of phenomenology mm-hmm. and what that, what that meant for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know he was familiar with Hegel. So, mm-hmm. um, but just in general, if you have any insight into that, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not a student of phenomenology, okay, so don't push me on this. And I'd be really interested to hear what you what you think of this. So ask me whatever you like, and I'll try and answer as best I can from Proudhon's point of view, but I'm not an expert. But my, my understanding is that phenomenology, as a branch of philosophy, looks at, you know, the ways in which the world, the, the phenomena of life, constitute right. ourselves and others. And it's really quite different to the sort of Kantian way, which looks at the ways in which reasons constitute the world. And I think this is the way that Hegel did it too. But I think for Proudhon, it's a much more positivist enterprise, Okay, looking at the ways in which the world around us shapes us. 
So in the first book of War and Peace is called The Moral Phenomenology of War. And what he's trying to do there is show us that, that war is not an aberration. It's not something that is extra social, that exists somewhere else, that's exogenous to society. War is fundamentally social. Okay, and you know, and he takes this from people like Joseph de Maistre and others. You know, there's a long tradition in European thought thinking about the sort of vitalist social uh, regeneration aspects of war. I mean, Proudhon's not arguing that at all, but you know, it was a strong current, still is in many uh, many places. Again, linking to the fascism, right? So we need to keep that in mind here. Um, but what what Proudhon argues is that if we look at war as an aberration, we never really understand its role in the constitution of modern politics. If we see war as a moral enterprise, and we look at the way in which the moral phenomenology of war uh, manifests, we get a much stronger sense of what war is. And so for him, the phenomenology of war includes um, you know, uh, the the rituals and practices of the battlefield, the ways in which um, the unspoken rules of gallantry or, you know, the ways in which war manifests in the epics, for example, you know, the whether that's the Bible, the struggle between good and evil or, you know, the, the Norse mythology and the ways in which Odin, you know, all the way war is, you know, saturates our modern and ancient consciousness it it shapes everything we we think about in terms of right and wrong in really important ways and so when Proudhon's talking about phenomenology then he wants us to think about the ways in which those ideas shape us as individuals but also our societies and the ways in which that struggle which in this case war is actually just a sort of generalization of a much more banal form of struggle which is just living Okay, so he thinks that all of life is really a struggle, um, in the, not in a particularly prosaic way, but you know, all of life is a struggle. And in that sense, what he's trying to do is get us to think about the phenomenology of that. So to think about society as, as a real context for the production of people, of ideas, and so on. And that stands in stark contrast to what was going on elsewhere in social theory at that time, right? So, I mean, we often think of Marx as like the beginning of this sort of materialist account of society. Actually, it was Auguste Comte who drove this politics. So Comte was a staunch positivist, was believed that, you know, society moved through three phases. He said it's the, you know, the ancient, the the metaphysical, and it's the philosophical, and then it's the positivist age, that the only thing that really drives society is transformations in the material structures of society, that individuals don't matter, that ethics don't matter, that really the only thing that drives us is biology. And Marx took all of that and ran with it, but then gave it a sort of socialist flavour. Proudhon was like, this is garbage. I mean, you know, this can't be true. How could this be true? I mean, essentially, Comte was uh, argued that, you know, free will doesn't exist and we should stop thinking about it. And we should stop talking about freedom because freedom is a myth and so on. And that if, you know, if you really understand the ways in which the material structures of society produce us, you will see that actually we have no free will. We are made by society. Uh, what does he say? The the dead rule the living is his is his classic quote, I think. And Proudhon says this can't be true. We, there must be a, a zone. There must be some way of thinking about individual freedom. And he takes this from the liberal tradition, the republican tradition, but also tries to reframe this positivist politics. So the phenomenology then is is deeply empirical. Okay, whereas it could you might think of it as ideal or epistemic. In other traditions, the Proudhon, this is a sociological enterprise, right? It's trying to understand the empirics of, of morality. And that's really unique, I think, at that time. And it's a real shame that, that it got, you know, pushed by the wayside. Uh, in the I really, I think, to me, that really does sound like a, phen- a phenomenological approach to mm. social theory versus, right. you know, like this sort of positivist or... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know the, what whatever kind of scientific uh, approach other social scientists want to make. Um, I forgot where I was going to go from there, but um, right. So one of the things that a lot of existential phenomenologists will write about is technology mm-hmm. and the way that that ties into uh, the the way humans exist really 
And I know War and Peace, uh, Prudhoe gets into that. And I think you write about the way that this changed for him the nature of war mm. and um, uh, was catastrophic in his opinion. Mm. And I wanted uh, to hear you elaborate a little bit on that and how that plays into his work. Mm. And this is this is a really important aspect of the book. I mean, so you got to remember that Proudhon's writing in the 1860s, and this is about the time that we see the the sort of first emergence of the Industrial Revolution. And it's not, of course, we often think of the Industrial Revolution as you know um, looms and manufacturing in Manchester and so on. We tend to forget that actually some of the earliest. Um, manufacturing would have been around military armaments right so the development of steel hull iron hull ships rifling uh, was was invented at that time machine guns or the mini gun you know those you know dynamite was attempted you were trying to put dynamite and make controlled explosions this is this is developing at that time too this is you know this this transforms the way in which war is being fought it's a military revolution of a, a, a sort of qualitative magnitude we haven't seen for millennia Okay, so we often think of the transformation of warfare as being spurred by things like the stirrup that allowed people to ride on horses or, you know, the development of the lance or military tactics. But the 19th century transformed all of that. Okay, so not only do we have the emergence of these nation states that are pulling people together, that that consolidation of industry, that development of, of surplus was then put into the development of armaments. And this transformed Europe. So. Technology then for Proudhon is a double-edged sword. I'm not sure that I mean I'm sure that's a pun as well as a very unfortunate. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, the, the 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 point he's trying to make here is that it used to be the case that war was this sort of chivalric, uh, you know, as a duel between nations. And there's a really interesting set of passages in War and Peace where he makes this this sort of inverse comparison. He basically says that that. While dueling has become more and more, um, shall we say, equalized, okay, so from like fighting by proxy on horseback with lances back in ancient times to sort of pistols at dawn in shirt sleeves, he says that that relationship has become ever more equalized and the opposite has happened in war. So it used to be that it was a more or less equal struggle between peoples. You know, dying was never the the option. People went and signed up for for, for the army to see the world or whatever. It wasn't until the 19th century that death on the battlefield became more of a certainty, whether that's through shrapnel or through disease or or just by being bombed and shot. So you know, this is a this is a qualitative transformation in in the, the pursuit of war at that time. So Proudhon's thinking, you know, we need to understand what's happening here. And he tries to tell a story about, in book two of War and Peace, about the way in which war has changed, the forms of war, as he calls them, and to show how over time wars have become ever more violent and destructive and the ways in which they have centralised and caused the production of states. Um, and this is, this is a central element of what he, he's trying to do in this book. And he says that either, you know, he says that if, if armaments become such that, um, that, uh, that, or if armaments will become such that if essentially war will be won by the most, uh, by the most villainous, because as soon as you've got the most, um, destructive technology, you will win. And that doesn't, that's got nothing to do with valor. It's got nothing to do with your cause. It's literally because you've got the biggest bombs. So, you know, he says that this, and I want to tell you a little bit more about that in a second, but I mean, it's really important that we trace the relationship between the use of force and the justification for the use of force, because Proudhon thinks that those two things have to be understood together. So if we don't understand how force is justified, you never really understand how justice works in society or what props up political communities. Okay, well, go on, uh, go on about that, because that's... Uh... Okay. I mean, this yeah. this is really important, right? So, technology, yeah, it's not Proudhon's not a pacifist, okay? So, Tolstoy becomes a pacifist after reading War and Peace, and you know, much of what Tolstoy does with his politics later is this sort of denunciation of violence. It's this argument that violence will never can never be the basis for any politics. I mean, Proudhon says similar things, but doesn't quite take it that far. Tolstoy runs with it. Now, it's important for Proudhon 
to understand the way in which violence and force are linked. So, as I said, the phenomenology of war, you know, you can see it in the epics, you can see it in the Bible, you know, it's part and parcel of how we think about ourselves as people. But we need to understand that, he says, historically. So over over the course of the centuries, the eons, the millennia, and he's only looking at European society here. He doesn't make any crass generalizations about non-European societies. In that respect, he's a he's very Eurocentric, but at least what you're not getting in this is you know ridiculous claims about primitive peoples and so on. That just doesn't exist in this book. But what he does argue is that you know, in European societies, the ways in which we've rationalized force have been central to the ways in which we've built political communities. So it used to be the case that war was simply glorified as plunder, he argues. Okay, so right up until Alexander the Great, essentially communities would develop if they met um, economic catastrophe, should we say, they will just plunder the neighboring towns and villages. Okay, plunder was part and parcel of what it meant to be part of a political community and somebody's neighbor. Over time, that developed. Uh, plundering, particularly says this cutoff point, is Alexander the Great. So from Alexander the Great onwards, what we see is this development of a, of a period of conquest. And so in conquest, rather than going in, taking the goods and running off, what you do is you go in, you take the territory, you take the people, it becomes yours, they become your slaves, essentially, and in reality too. And then in the third phase, the modern phase, then the one he's looking at at the time, it's the development of sovereignty in the nation state. Now, through each of those phases, the way in which war is glorified, written about in the epics, helps you understand the, the fabric of that political community. So um, in an age of plunder, there will be martial valour, there will be you know clear social hierarchies and so on. And then that the way in which those epics change, so the emergence of, let's say, Christianity, shapes the way in which people understand the relationships to others and so on. And so in the Bible, you find, and he draws in the Bible routinely in this, you find this two ways of thinking about uh, war and violence. On the one hand, it's about, you know, um, God, I'm trying to think of examples now, but the way in which, let's say, uh, God commands people to, you know, rape and pillage and so on. And this becomes part of particularly the Old Testament. And then you see that shifts later when, you know, you turn the other cheek and Jesus becomes this new Christian who brings people together and so on. You see that transformation in the way in which war and violence is, is thought about reflects the way in which those societies are changing and developing. Um, and you see that again later. So he's arguing then, now, if you look at the ways in which modern conceptions of justice and right are articulated, they're often told to us, particularly today, you know, we all share these inalienable rights. You know, we're born with them. You know, they're, they're part of who we are. And that, that is that this this Republican peace that we have is has nothing to do with violence. The only reason that we're free today is because we've don't have violence in our politics. And we tell each other these stories to try and convince one another that, the, that our societies are more peaceful, more just, more progressive than anything that's happened in the past. And Proudhon says that's complete garbage. He says that, you know, that the only reason we're able to have those conversations is precisely because of the consolidation of violence within society. So society is fundamentally structured by violence. And he says, you know, you can't you can't make any claim about social stasis or stability without reference to the massive violence it takes to maintain that order. You know, we're talking today. I mean, you know, I don't have to tell you. You know, we look at the ways in which we have these arguments about defunding the police or just you know about um, carcerality or you know, but that, that, those are just the sort of the visceral, the really brutal ways in which we see it. But most of modern society is structured around um, the threat of violence. Okay, so whether that is in patriarchal families or whether that's in, um, you know, uh, anti-trans discourse or whatever it is, that, that violence fundamentally shapes those relationships, even if it's never actualized. And so Proudhon okay. says the way in which we think about that you have to think about that not just in terms of violence, but in terms of justifications of right and wrong. Sorry, you were going to ask a question. Yeah, let me pause you right there because there is a. I didn't get through the whole book yet, but there is a part in there where he does talk about the way that it uh, war shapes gender norms, mm. which you just briefly touched on. And uh, a kick I've been on lately is this whole investigation of the the way uh, war and gender relate to each other and mm. uh, inform each other. 
And I was wondering, you know, because I didn't get all the way through this yet, uh, how much he works with that whole uh, interaction throughout the rest mm. of the book. Yeah, it's really, it's the it's some of the most unpleasant parts of the book, to be honest. Um, so, it, I mean, it, it's also quite complicated, as it always is. And basically, Proudhon argues that um, mo- uh, society, let's say modern society, it, it, particularly the way in which we uh, the, the soldier has valour and virtue is derived from particular gender roles and that women are encouraged to idolise um, the soldier uh, and the soldier is um, encouraged to see women as the prize of war and so on. Um, but he says that this is this is this can't be the case. I mean, this is this is this is a social convention. He says that it's built on violence and that this is really problematic. Um, but it's central to how he understands uh, social relations because he says that it's because women can't fight that they are naturally inferior to men. Okay, so he on the one hand he's making an egalitarian claim on the basis of an inegalitarian claim. <laughs> so it's 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 complicated, but it it makes sense in his schema. I mean, th- there is a lot of literature that says that. Well, there's a really good book by uh, is it Joshua Goldstein where he talks about. Yeah, um, I actually have that right. Right. Okay. <laughs> he 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 makes a really interesting claim. That's the one. Yeah. So he makes a really interesting claim about the way in which you know societies over time have essentially selected out particular character traits, and that it's not so much that women are less strong than men, but that the the social reproduction of those gender roles has meant that women have always taken on those uh, less martial uh, activities, and then that has compounded really small differences in biology, and then entrenches them in particular social structures. I mean, I think Proudhon would probably agree with that. But I think he would make much more absolutist claims about differences between men and women that I think we'd all find right. palatable he, today. He, yeah, he'd go and essentialize it. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, back to what you were where you left off at um, that this uh, war is really a foundation of our sense of justice and and right and wrong, and you if you don't start there, then you're missing a big piece of the picture. Mm. Um, what uh just what do, do you have any closing remarks on on that book because i did want to move on a little bit to some other writing you've done and uh some of the other thoughts outside of fruit home uh, let me just say quickly about how the book's structured and then you know give people a sense of what how the argument progresses for, through war and peace i mean so the first part of the book the first book looks at the moral phenomenology of war and he wants to try and unpack how that ethics is part of how war is fought and the way in which war is justified always appeals to these prior and really important social norms. But then the way in in the book two, he then argues, well, the way in which war is fought always contravenes those high ideals that we have. So priests may open battles and sanctify the battleground, but ultimately what happens on, on the battleground desecrates society. And so the way in which you fight then shapes the outcome of the war. And so he says that this, this di- what later became known as a dialectic, he doesn't really talk about it in those terms. You know, there's this process that if unfurls where the struggle for justice becomes undermined by the ways in which people attempt to realize that. And usually it's through violence. And so then in book three, he tries to show how that emerged through the, the fighting of wars in the 19th century, particularly the, the revolutionary wars of Napoleon. And he says that centrally, this is about a struggle for social order, but about justice and about the exercise of force. And he says that underneath all of this is this tacit right to force. He says that all of society, so the one thing that war shows us is that society is founded on a tacit right of force. Okay, whether that's respecting our elders, whether that is accepting the force of a stronger argument, whether that is uh, the force of logic, or whether that is the force of gravity, he says that forces fundamentally structure all of society. And what war helps us understand is that this has to be the focus of our social science, because if we want to find that perfect constitution, we need to understand how those forces work. 
And his is a non-reductive account, so he doesn't reduce it to one or another thing. And he tries to show how society is fundamentally plural and that it's the struggle between these different forces that shapes the society within which we live. And then in the, third, uh, in the fourth book, he argues that uh, the, the dynamism of that is fueled by this inequality. So inequality is what drives social change and the struggle for justice is, is essentially this attempt to address questions of inequality. And in the last book, he looks at the transformation of war. And so what he's trying to do in that last book is think about what a positive peace would look like. So one of the problems he's left with, of course, is that, you know, there isn't really a sense in which you can take force and violence out of society. He says that that's really not possible. But he says that you, if we can recognise its role in society, we can better organise such that we don't need to resort to it. Of course, the problem you're left with is this notion that essentially society becomes pacified okay, by, the, by the ominous threat of violence. And the question then is, who should be in control of the violence? And so it is a socialist, it is a populist, if you like, account of how the people should be in control of their own destinies. And so then what, what he's arguing is, he doesn't finish it here, but he says, you know, we need to find a better constitutional model that enables us to balance power within and between society such that we don't need to resort to violence in order to address problems of inequality. And in the next four books, five books, he writes, he looks at the, the principle of federation. He looks at the unification of Italy, Poland, um, you know, and a whole bunch of other things to try and really explore that constitutional politics. Um, but that comes in later books. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if we could combine two questions that I have. One, uh, uh, do you want to return to talking about constitutionality and how that works in an in a anarchist framework? Um, the other is, you know, you co-edited a book on libertarian socialism. Um, and I get a lot of questions from people uh, when it comes to, you know, what exactly do Marxists say that Crudhon and other anarch Bakunin did not say? And what are the differences? And what is this nether region of libertarian socialism? Mm. Those are two things I wanted to talk to you about. And um, mm. Well, let me, let One me or two or both. Okay, let me, um, let me do the constitutions thing. So um, Ruth Kinner and I are, are currently trying to finish a book on con anarchist constitutional politics. Um, we're trying to show how we, we have a sort of three theory chapters and three empirical chapters in this where we're looking at, beginning we talk about anarchy as a constitutional principle. So we argue that, that it is possible and routine for anarchists to organise their communities without a final point of authority, which is how we define anarchy. And uh, in the absence of a final point of authority, what you're obliged to do, of course, is find ways of balancing power without anyone taking precedence. And that's a really innovative and imaginative way of thinking about in constitutional politics, which, of course, runs anathema. It's anathema to, to the modern tradition. So I'll, I'll, I'll just leave that there and say, you know, watch this space, because that's what we're trying to develop over the next few years and of course it comes out of the classical tradition we've done a lot of work on that and are then, you familiar yeah go on. oh are you familiar with Catherine malibu and her recent uh she's a french philosopher put out a book just recently about called stop thief uh anarchism in philosophy is the subtitle i think no i haven't seen that i'll have to check it out yeah because she she in that book uh, this is like within the past year this came out. So she gets into this whole notion of anarchy and it's Aristotelian and pre-Socratic mm -hmm. sense as like a non-principle uh, or no, like basically no final point of authority, mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying. Uh, and you haven't heard of it. So there's not a lot we could talk about, but I know, that sounds, it sounds great. I mean, it, it, you know, I'm always heartened when I hear this because it's really nice to know that people are doing this sort of work. I think, you know, ironically, anarchists have been pretty poor at theorizing the concept of anarchy, <laughs> which yeah. is really surprising. I mean, there's a few pieces by Malatesta. You see something by Kropotkin. You know, there's some stuff in the, you know, temporary autonomous zones literature later about ontological anarchy came later in the 90s. But we don't really see very much systematic thinking about the concept of anarchy. So it's great to hear that people are doing that. So, you know, 
please, any any other references, send them my way. I'll definitely, because uh, I don't even think she's an anarchist. I think right, she's right. just noticed in, like, uh, you know, Deleuze, Guattari, and uh, yeah, right. of uh, yeah, some yeah. of these other people, Foucault, just like yeah. anarchist. Anarchy is this unspoken thing yeah. they're actually really all talking about. Okay, now no, I understand the links, yeah. So people like, I mean, if you look at those sort of links from, uh, from yeah, Deleuze and Guattari, Rancière, um, uh, you know, Rancière's notion of anarche is basically anarchist, and people like Todd May and Nathan Jun have, have worked mm-hmm. to try and unpack that. And so there's a, there's a real post-Marxist anarchist tradition there, which is really interesting. And it's interesting to see how that sort of post-Marxism has essentially arrived at a sort of an unreconstructed anarchism, essentially. And that's it's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And I suppose that's a nice little segue into that second question of yours, right? So, you know, this libertarian socialist tradition. Um, so I've actually published three edited collections on this. So the one with Ruth, Dave, and, and Saku uh, was the first, but subsequently I published two special issues with Owen Worth on who's who's uh, was the editor for Capital and Class. Uh, and so what we've done is we've tried to show these links between anarchism and Marxism over the last 150 years. The first book looked at it historically. The second book looked at it uh, in terms of the philosophy, the political theory of the linkages between the two. And the third one looked at social movements in the contemporary global South and elsewhere. And what we've basically tried to do all the way through these three books is to sort of get rid of the notion that there's some categorical distinction between different branches of socialism and that if you look at all of these socialist ideas they all exist in a sort of an ecosystem as a constellation of 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 concepts that most share and that those historical trajectories and the differences are highly politicized but not substantive enough uh, to constitute let's say you know distinctive traditions because they borrowed from each other all the time you see Proudhon in Marx and Marx in the Proudhonists and later on it you know whether that's don't forget Bakunin was a you know was such a massive fan of Marx to begin with at least right and they, they fell out on on political projects not on the analysis and so you see what we're trying to do is pull that together later I mean I think you know the, the basic point to make about Proudhon and Marx given that that's where my research lies is that you know Marx wrote some a really rubbish book on Proudhon. It was a great book on Marx, but it said nothing about Proudhon, uh, nothing that actually re- reflects anything Proudhon wrote anyway. Uh, uh, but it's a great book, I suppose. Um, but Proudhon basically didn't bother with Marx at all for you know the 25 years that he was publishing. It does not feature anywhere in Proudhon's writings after 1842. It's because Marx was, you know, it was a nobody, really. Um, and I think that this is, you know, over-egging that debate gets really tiring. And I think there's more to be had from thinking about the, the linkages between the two, thinking about the failures of both sides of the argument, the anti-statist and the statist argument, looking at the failures of both of those of those traditions and trying to learn from them, essentially. Well, yeah, unfortunately, it's a problem that I don't think we're ever going to be able, you know, as socialists are ever going to be able to get past because if you become... Marxists are by far the more well-known uh, in the academy and around the world at the moment. And if you become a Marxist, you're you're definitely going to wind up reading his criticisms of Proudhon. And that that's going to be really a, found, a foundational idea for why you are not an anarchist. Mm-hmm. So eventually, you're gonna ha- we're just always going to have that uh, circling back around to what the differences are. But... Mm-hmm. Um, one of the one of the things that keeps coming up because I like to look at the situationists a lot mm-hmm. and just this whole idea of council communism mm-hmm. and what what is the difference between that and a lot of what anarchists have proposed? Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not a scholar of council communism. I've got a colleague, James Muldoon's written a really good book on this, and I strongly recommend it. Um, the, you know, the, the councilist tradition is essentially what you would call anarchism or a sort of branch of anarcho-syndicalism perhaps you know this notion that um autogestion where you your self-control or self-organization of the workers is the you know is the the nucleus of freedom and i don't think there's very much difference between that and a classic sort of prudonist as it became after the um after the um the paris commune that you know that prudonist notion of autogestion uh 
is very similar to council communism. And you see it then working out in the Italian, the operismo, you know, this the workers taking control and understanding um, the conditions of their own freedom in and through the work that they do. I mean, that's a classically sort of an arco syndicalist uh, way of understanding the workplace. The difference lies in whether those two movements are party oriented or not. And, and that's really the difference. And that's, that's a strategy question, really, not a substantive analysis problem. Um, and both have failed. I mean, there's no question about it, right? I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't think either, either can, can, can boast success. I mean, the only thing that the anarchists have got going for them really is the fact that, you know, and I, I, the Marxists failed and the, they had a, an open field, really, and the anarchists never really got a proper look in. I think Simon Choke put it really nicely. He said, uh, you know, the only reason anarchists haven't got any blood on their hands is because they had so little in them. <laughs> 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 exactly. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty grim. I mean, you've got a pretty dark sense of humor to find that funny. But I'm guilty. Yeah. Well, uh, and just on a final note, I guess you know you were you, uh, uh, as we said in the introduction, Anarchist Studies Network is uh, it's uh, you know you helped start that in two thousand five. It's been a huge influence on everything I've studied because, I mean, I you know got into anarchism in 2001, 2002. So I I do want to ask you just about anarchism generally within the academy and how, where it was when you started that up and where it is now, because it's, I think it's been a pretty big success. Mm. Yeah, we had a we had, we did a roundtable on this at the PSA conference last year, and we were sort of reflected on that. I think Jesse Cohn did uh, probably put it best. I mean, anarchist studies has always been there in the academy. It's just been subterranean. It's been, you know, it's not been. It, it was never the focus of people's studies, and those people that did study it never really admitted to engaging quite as deeply with it as they probably did. People like, particularly in sociology, Weber, you know, the French sociological tradition, deeply influenced by the anarchists, you know, any sort of um, non-Marxist or post-Marxist approach usually drew on anarchist ethos, particularly through the 70s and the Cold War. So when we get to the 1999, uh, I think the real surprise was that, you know, the academy exploded in size, right? And the way, like in, in the aftermath of the civil rights movement, you know, it was people that were in part of those struggles that went and worked in higher education, right? Took those projects in as their PhD research and then looked to sort of pluralize the academy, whether it's people of color or women. Uh, and so the same traditions and the same transformation happened after 1999, Battle of Seattle, the global anti-globalization movement. It was it was us that sort of went into the academy, right? But we got there and found that there wasn't really an anarchism worth, that we could really speak of. Um, and the notions of anarchism that were circulating were highly problematic. But we essentially did what had been done before, which was to set up journals and you know, study groups and specialist groups and try and bring people together and have those conversations. And I think over the last 15 years, I think the real, um, I think the real success has been to make the network not redundant necessarily, but the whole point of the Anarchist Studies Network was to give people a sense of confidence in what they were doing, to provide a network that would allow people to share their research with one another and so on. And I think over the last 15 years, it's become less and less valuable because more and more of us are able to publish in normal mainstream journals, publish in decent book series with well-reputed presses, get proper jobs and so on. And I suppose in that respect, it's become a little institutionalized. But, you know, we've been struggling with that problem right from the outset, you know, this activist academic link and how we make our research valuable for social movements and how social movements can be part of the academy and vice versa. You know, that's been a constant struggle for us throughout this last 15 years. But, and I don't think we've resolved that issue, that no, no, no way, but we have been thinking about it for 15 years. So I suppose the success is that we've changed the narrative around anarchist studies, particularly in the UK, perhaps less so in the United States, but certainly in the UK and perhaps in Europe, you know, there's a real sense that anarchist studies isn't just a fringe movement. It's part of 
part of debates. I mean, not particularly vocal part of debates or visible, but it's certainly a part of what's going on in higher education in, in the UK at the moment. Well, it's definitely getting there <laughs> mm. and becoming more visible. Mm. Um, so is there anything else you want to talk about before we uh, uh, say goodbye to our viewers? No, no, I think that's it. I mean, I, unless you've got any other questions, I mean, I could talk all night, but um, but I, you know, it's it's up to you. I'm good. All right. Well, I, I could think of a bunch, but maybe we should save them, have you back some time, or or okay. do some, <laughs> split that up a little bit. That'd be good. Yeah. All right. I'll go ahead and end the recording now. Thank you again uh, for coming on. I again, I've been really looking forward to this. No, no worries. Thanks very much indeed.